that that's maybe quite a big big sentence yeah say a bit more about that are you talking about like therapy in the past as in dealing with the the hurt child that experienced it maybe yes because the problems why people um function unhealthily in the present isn't to be found in the present no it's to be found in the past we demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations this is the therapy show behind closed doors podcast with bob cook and jackie jones Welcome back to episode 66 with myself, Jackie Jones, and of course, the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook, as always. And what we're going to be looking at in this episode is the importance of retrieval of memories in the therapy process. Well, thank you for those kind words. And, always, uh, Bob. Uh, that's very nice of you. Now, this subject area is very dear to my heart, and I think retrieval of past memories is so central. Um, to the development of the therapeutic process and people's change uh, that it's imperative to talk about. Yeah. Okay, so is it okay if I just start? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So I would lose count um, about how many times cl clients have come in uh, in the assessment processes. And often when I work privately with them and say what's the difference between counseling and psychotherapy and um it's a very very big subject and i usually give a very superficial <laughs> reply in a way and for people listening here or counselors uh this is you may have different versions of what you see as the difference between counseling and psychotherapy and also the similarities so Bear with me. So uh, I will say very briefly, because I didn't have that much time in an assessment process usually, <clears throat> it says with counselling and psychotherapy, number one, they're trained differently. Yeah. Um, so, for example, um, psychotherapists are, are, are trained how to deal with disturbed people and counsellors aren't. But the most important thing, really, I think, in the domain of psychotherapy is psychotherapists... Uh, we'll look at how the past affects the present. But counsellors are more likely to stay with the present. Yeah. Now, of course, I know there's been the rise of therapeutic counsellors, so I think the um, whole conversation can get overlapping there. But I want to talk about psychotherapy, in-depth clinical psychotherapy, uh, where the major focus is how the past affects the present. Yeah. And transaction analysis, the way I use transaction analysis and think about transaction analysis, is a psychodynamic model, which is primarily looking at how the past affects the present. Now, you can use TA in a very different way, in a much more short term way, uh, where you're looking at the present much more and you're looking at behavioral change. I mean, Eric Byrne was very much in, uh, 70 years ago talked about how you strengthen the adult and not go particularly into the past. But for me, psychotherapy, in-depth psychotherapy is how the past affects the present. Would you see it that way? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Oh. Yeah. And that's, you know, it sounds quite obvious when you <clears> think <throat> about it, but, you know, the, the past and the future is where all I was suffering is to be in the moment is, you know, where we should all try to be. But our past has a, a wonderful way of coming into our present mm. through memories, through feelings. That's right. Through experience, memory. through all, uh, all, all those range things. Of things. Yeah. Absolutely. So as a therapist, I would always be interested in how people are in, enacting out their past, not only with me as a therapist, but also in terms of functioning in the here and now. Yeah. Now, TA, you might simply want to say, um, concentrating on a person's script and how they play out their life plan, if you like, uh, in the present with me. 
and also looking at how their script or their past hinders their healthy mechanisms in the present. Yeah. So most people I've ever seen through the door, this is what therapy is about. Because otherwise, they wouldn't be coming through the door. Yeah. If they didn't have any problems in their functioning or present, they wouldn't come through, be coming through the door. No. And it is their, uh, their issues in the past with their enacting out in the present, which causes the problems. So the therapy is to be found in the past, not the present, from my position. Okay. Is that, that's maybe quite a big, big sentence. Yeah. Say a bit more about that. Are you talking about like therapy in the past, as in dealing with the, the hurt child that experienced it, maybe? Yes, because the problems why people um, function unhealthily in the present isn't to be found in the present. No. It's to be found in the past. Yeah. But we, found... See, that's what I think with counselling is the difference between counselling and psychotherapy is that maybe the talk techniques to deal with the symptoms of their past. Mm. They don't necessarily deal with whatever happened in the past, but the talk techniques that's right. have to deal with it. So psychotherapy for me is to help the person reflect, yeah. visit, talk about the wounded parts of their history yeah or the traumas if you like yeah that have happened in the history uh, which they've defended against or moved into survival mode if you like yeah um, to get by in the world and often quite successfully by the way uh, and perhaps doesn't help them anymore today uh, maybe in personal or emotional relationships. Yeah. And that's often why therapy is quite difficult because you are going back to some places that hold a lot of herd. <laughs> and it's a very slow process. It's not like we, you know, I suppose I do do a timeline, you know, of certain points in people's lives when I'm first seeing them just to get a feel for them. <clears throat> yeah. But you don't just, dive in straight away into those hurt places no so when i'm talking about memories uh i need another statement about trauma yeah to help along the way yeah so most people i have seen and are still in a couple of groups come into therapy because of past trauma now that could be really massive trauma which will abuse it could be high degrees of sexual abuse, it could be uh, physical abuse, it could be abandonment, it could be neglect. We could go through trauma. Yeah. So it's hard to say a continuum of minor trauma to uh, <coughs> intense trauma. So I'm just using the word traumatic moments here, if you like. Now, the major way that people defend against trauma and memories of the trauma is to lock the trauma away in compartments, if you like, let's yeah. use that as a metaphor in people's psychological spirits, and not to revisit again, either emotionally or through memory. Yeah. And then they find coping mechanisms to deal with life um, uh, in, in a so-called, if you like, healthy way. But until the trauma is visited or the compartments are opened a bit then all the energy are, uh, by the uh, person if you like is dealt with is, is all about keeping those compartments closed and denying their memories emotionally or actually physically yeah. um, so this is where the defense of denial comes in and they deny their memories as well as their emotions. So when I say retrieval of memories, I'm talking about going into the trauma and dealing with the memories that people have de denied through dissociation or disavowed mechanisms um, so they can actually move towards integration instead of fragmentation 
yeah find a healthy way of living yeah and that that's a real journey to to go back to look at it do you know what i mean to bring it all together to move forward it's it's a long process for people to be able to do that it's not something you can do in six weeks or two months or something no this is when i'm talking about this type of work uh, which is deep trauma yeah we're talking more in years yeah rather than months or weeks yeah so people who've had uh, may come in for post-traumatic st stress or come in with challenging histories, they usually uh, will have what in the trade we call dissociative processes. Yeah. And that might include amnesia, denial, flashbacks, depersonalization, all ways of movements away from the self. Yeah. And memory. Yeah. So when I talk about memory retrieval, I'm talking about helping a person finding parts of themselves which have been safely put away so that they can function, but actually doesn't help them today. Yeah. Somebody once said to me, and it might have actually been in supervision, I'm, I'm not sure. You know, when, when I look at myself and my earliest memories, I think my earliest memories, I was probably about four or five. Like, you know, things like my first day at school. I've got flashbacks of my first day at school and everything. Is there a point where we can start to lay down memories? Because I think it was in supervision, somebody said that until you've got the power of language, you can't lay down proper memories. Well, there's a difference between implicit memories and explicit memories. So um, it depends what that person meant by lay down memories as well. But very, but a lot of memories are held in the body. Well, that's it, somatic memories and just that feeling yeah. and that yeah. sense of something rather yeah. than actual yeah. playing out a film or, or however a memory right. is. Yeah. I went for a massage the other day in a place I hadn't been before, actually, by the way. Um, and annoyingly, the, ther the massage therapist talked from the beginning to the end. So Ooh, I yeah. eventually said, well, actually, I've come in here to relax rather than, than, than not. But in this talking phase of hers, I, I did make the sort of, I think because I'm a born therapist, I did sort of um, talk about a few things. But one of the things she was talking about uh, was, um, because she knew I was a therapist, uh, about emotions being held in the body. So yeah. I said, have you had any training to deal with what happens? if suddenly somebody regresses in front of you because they've massaged, you know, an area. In and, part, yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> no, she said. So I said, well, I think all massage people are, are going to work in the way that, you, you know, even in the way you work, which is quite light, should have had some basic training. On knowledge, what, yeah. If a person regresses in front of you. And I, I, I believe that because there's a lot of... There's a tremendous lot of emotions, especially if you've had a lot of trauma, yeah. which is held up and held in the body. Yeah. And, you know, therapists need to tread very lightly. They certainly don't do massage, obviously. But, you know, I think that massage therapists should have some sort of information about this. So what I'm saying around a way by saying that, uh, I don't know what you mean by lay down, but I do know that a lot of early um, feelings and memories are locked up in the body. Yeah. It's called somatic, and you use the word somaticness. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and memories can be triggered through all of our senses. For me, smell is a really strong trigger for mm. memories. If I smell something, it can, you know, transport me back to something in my past. That's memory to go, of course. Yeah. So, sorry, sense. So if you're working with somebody, if you want to do retrieval of memory work, uh, please remember the sense is the last sense, in, is one of the most keenest senses of all. And um, it's a very important one. People being abused usually uh, are very triggered 
by smell yeah. and, uh, and and that type that sense um and often then if we're out of that can come memory yeah which again in the therapy room you know we we, we don't want to depersonalize it altogether but it is something to be aware of if you've got you know a candle with a certain smell on it or if you've got a certain picture in the room or whatever that that can be you know a, a trigger or a memory jolt for a, you know certain people absolutely now of course if you're doing trauma work with people traumatized and you need to take them back there that needs to be done in a contractual safe way in context of the development of the therapy that's okay because that's all being you know you might use i don't know, visualizations to get back to sense to actually trigger memories by the way but yeah. what you're talking about is when it what you're actually talking about is when these things have not been contracted for at all and the therapist hasn't thought about triggers and hasn't thought about particularly thought about the things that you and i are talking about so they can be triggered very easily yeah i i was with somebody assessment and um only the other day and something in the room he said he said um you know this um certain object in the room triggered him back and this was in the assessment yeah now i said well, well let's stay where we are in the here and now and i'll pass this on to the therapist that you i'm passing you on to um are you able to we'll pass this object to the to the offices it happened and he said yes and we went out yeah right i think therapists you want a really interesting point here because I think therapists need to think about how how their actual office or therapist room is. Yes, yeah. Psychoanalysts way back in the day believed in having no pictures, having no, nothing that would stimulate or trigger um, uh, these memories or these associations until the right time up on their walls. So... It's a very good conversation to have about with therapists. So today, in fact, only today, one of these therapists came into the room and said to me, at my institute, I was in there, said, oh, I'm starting my therapy up and they're working from home and they sat there and showed me pictures. And they're lovely. I can see it was a lovely, uh, I think, therapeutic space. I said, oh, you know, that's really good. And maybe you'll be able to show your supervisor that. Right. Now, in terms of this conversation, I think the supervisor would do, it would be very good to look at these pictures because yeah. there could be a discussion about, well, you know, what's in the room? How can we put this in the room? Uh, you know, have you, you know, I can see there's candles there or not candles there. What was your thought about incense and how come the room's pink? It wasn't in this particular pink yeah, shit. Yeah. You know, have you thought about how that might stimulate? anybody coming in the room in terms of an aggressive way yeah and it's a really good point that you touched on that if a client is triggered to know how to ground them to bring them back into the present to get them back into the here and now oh i clearly tell in the case i've just said i clearly said to, to the person look i'm glad you know what triggers you we're not going there now yeah. are you okay to move out of the room yeah and from a very adult way yeah in a very directive way so looking at retrieval of memories in the therapy process, mm. talk me through how you would use that in, in therapy with somebody. Well, just let me say why we would use it. Okay. I said a little bit about why we use it, would yeah. use it. From where I come from, which is a, you know, a relational integrative perspective using TA as a major model, but integration is the aim of the game. Yeah. People who, through trauma, have fragmented off or disowned parts of themselves so they can function and survive in life. But of course, as I said earlier on in this podcast, today it might have a high cost in terms of healthy living. And they come into therapy because they want to deal with their trauma and to have a more unified, you know, integrated sense of self, if you like. Yeah. Right? That's where we're heading. Now, to get there, 
we have to go back to help the person, you know, through inquiry, through achievement with the person, through involving yourself as a therapist. And we need to go back to find out what their defense mechanisms were, to look at, you know, the fragmentation, to help them look at the different parts of the self, to help them to actually debrief their trauma, if you like. And in that, we are always mindful of the retrieval of memories that often are being locked away, which may be so central to the trauma. Yeah. Memories such as what the abuser said to them. Memories such as what the abu abuse actually was, what, what actually happened in the yeah. trauma, for example, and how the therapist defended against ever remembering that and what the cost of that is. Yeah. For example. So I forgot what the question was. Was the question is how I do it? Well, yeah, how would you use memory retrieval in the oh, therapy process? Yeah, like I've just explained the reason why I would. Yeah. Explain the path, the methodology is very gentle. Number one, very slow. Number two, using inquiring questions about their history rather than interrogation or closed questions. Um, and when I say hypnotic induction, I mean... I don't mean him not in any sort of negative way. I mean, sentence constructions, which is slower and lower. Yeah. So the person relaxes. So the defenses go down more. So we can get the person to maybe talk about the trauma in ways they've never talked to anybody before. And out of that might come memories. Yeah. And it, it's, it's again about that, holding safe space so that they can and it an hour or 50 minutes which is a therapy hour isn't a very long time to to do that no do you know what very, i mean very very true that's you've kind of got you know 10 or 15 minutes going into it and then 15 okay. half an hour before you've got to make sure they're grounded enough coming out of that session yeah. So what I did when I when I was going to work in a what was what therapists called a regressive way, which means going back into time to where the trauma lay, would either be uh, an hour and a half session, yeah, or two sessions in the week. Right. Yeah. So I will build up what you're talking about here, which is protection and a safe place to actually. Uh, I also, also always check on support, yeah. how they're going to get home, Yeah. all these things. And the, the client's agreement to doing it rather than think, you oh, know, the yeah, therapist well, thinking, yeah. right, a week on Tuesday, yeah. I'm going to do this with them and just, yeah. And this will be very planned out. Yes, yeah. So, And I would call it retrieval of memory work, which is really, actually, Jackie, I could call it retrieval of trauma stroke memory work. Because yeah. it's actually helping a person, uh, you know, talk about their trauma. I'm not talking about reliving or, you know, or anything oh. like that. I'm just talking about talking about the flavour of the trauma. And even if the person only gets in touch with a segment of it, then we might go a bit deeper another time. Yeah. It's a process, never an event. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, like you said, it, you, you you know, we need to be so mindful that it is a very slow process and it's not rushed and it is sometimes dipping in and dipping out rather than going in and experiencing it fully, which can be re-traumatising for a client. Yeah, and what I'm talking about is in-depth psychotherapy. Yeah. And not all therapists, A, are trained to do it, B, even know how to do it, and C... Uh, may never do it. Yeah. Yeah, I think the first time it happened for me, it wasn't a planned thing. It was something in the room that triggered a client that suddenly brought up overwhelming feelings. And it was something we hadn't even spoken about. 
so yeah i i was very conscious of that mm. yeah mm. and and it, it was for me just a, a matter of having that safe space and grounding the client and then we went back and discussed it the week after yeah you absolutely it's a very good point it needs to be very slow yeah to be a safe pace yeah and you don't have to deal with you know what the trauma was in the moment you can deal with it next session yeah and come back to it and um at the pace of the client otherwise you're going to overwhelm the client so it's really really important to be attuned to the client and go to the go with the pace of the client Definitely. and have safety and security for the client is the top priority yeah yeah and, and you you know, it, 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 for me it is really important that the client feels in control in the session yeah they can say stop or no or i'm not ready at any yeah. point and the therapist would only do this sort of work way into the therapeutic yeah. process in other words they would have to know the client well yeah the client would have to know the therapist well feel they can trust them there needs to be quite a lot of sessions where the therapist understands the client and needs to be done developmentally um, in the therapeutic treatment so we are talking about quite a long way in yeah six months seven yeah. months eight months before you do any of this type of deep aggressive trauma retrieval of memory work yeah anyway. it actually helped me a, a lot with that client because you know the next week we did have a discussion about you know if that happens again what do you want from me good question do you know what i mean do do you want me to sit with you do you want me to touch you you know you say what it is that you want me to do if that does happen again mm. which made me what? feel a lot calmer in, in that space as, as well as the clients and i'm assuming i might be completely wrong here that it helped the client remember more things yeah 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 it opened up a whole new you know it, it wasn't the reason why they came to therapy in the first place but it opened up a whole new realm that we dipped a toe in oh. obviously you know over time but for me and the client to know if this did have this overwhelm happened again what do you want from me that's right so we are talking about retrieval of memory yeah we're doing it in a way where the client is safe and secure and in control and there can be a transparent discussion and inquiry about where we're going and what we're getting from it and you know how this is aiding therapy yeah and in a, in a way almost like sessional contracts yeah yeah definitely because i think clients do you know i can honestly say 99.9 percent .9 of, of sessions with clients don't always go the way that i had them planned in my head <laughs> you know the direction changes and there will be surprises in the therapy room and certain things will come up so we've got to be adaptable and be able to you know to, to recontract with the client well we have to have that level of flexibility yeah level of transparency uh without a shadow of a doubt but until we can help clients remember things that they don't allow themselves to remember because they need to keep themselves safe yeah then change may never happen no i agree and like you said it's not reliving the trauma it's not talking in depth about the trauma no it's just simply it's... touching yeah. um, their, their 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 experience but not reliving it no and it's validating it as well you know a, a lot of clients it mm. wasn't that bad or you know there's no reason why i should feel this way or whatever it is that they come out with but it's validating the response and reaction and feeling because you know mo i don't know a high number of clients many why would they want to remember yeah what was so horrific for them yeah they don't no I agree. So they put it away in a compartment, they dissociate, they deny, so that they can cope and go with light. And that is fantastic. And if that's if it that's works for yeah. them, you know, we'll never see them. Yeah. And that's fine. But if they come for therapy and there's a contract to actually look at how the past affects the present and 
be able to find out why they are so defensive in relationships, why they have intimacy issues, why communication breaks down, and all these things. And they believe is to do perhaps some of the traumas in the history. Then we have a contact and a therapy duty, I think, to help the person remember what perhaps was so, by definition, hard to remember. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's important as well that locking it away when they did was the best thing they could come up with at the time. Yeah, of course. <laughs> if there was an easier way or a more healthy way, they would have done it. But a lot of the time, that's the best solution. Just don't think about it. Lock it away. That's right. And I, I've said this in many podcasts. I'm saying here again. One of the major reasons most people come to therapy is to understand, get the, wanting their therapist to help them understand what has been so un, understandable for so many years. Yeah. Yeah. And the only way that can actually happen, contractually, of course, is to revisit challenges in their past and help them understand what maybe was so, under, so ununderstandable and and then they start to realize that in the contacts many, many years ago, it was made perfect sense. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then they're not going crazy. No, 100%, yeah. And that, that's a big thing with a lot of people, I think. Yeah, they think they're going crazy or there's something wrong with them or we could go on and on. Yeah. The things they I, I think it, you know... I, I, I know that it's coming up to the end of the podcast, but I know for me, in in my past, there has been times, you know, where where things have happened, and I can remember talking about it in a, a, a therapy session when when I was training. That I don't ever remember my mum being there. I know she was in the house, but I don't remember her being there. Mm -hmm. And it was said to me that maybe that's because she was in the house, but she wasn't emotionally available to you. So mm. my memory on certain things is quite skewed, mm. which again is something that can happen. <laughs> yeah, and it's helping the client understand what perhaps has been so ununderstandable. Yeah, yeah, mm. definitely. And it's a privilege to, to work with those clients. Oh, it's probably the biggest privilege of my career. Yeah. Because when I look back at my career, I think I'm very proud of the impact that I've had in helping people transform their lives. But we can only do that if the two of us have the transparent contract and courage to visit these parts of the self, which have been so un. un understandable and troublesome for people yeah i love the way that you put that bob and courage to do it for the therapist as well as the client oh both yeah and the other thing about this is and i said it earlier on the podcast is we need training therapists need training yeah. i was very very fortunate i did a whole training in transaction analysis for seven or eight years um, in, a, in a more cognitive behavioral type of training. And I then met a person who became my mentor, which is Richard Erskine Askley, who worked in this relational developmental way I've been talking about in this podcast. And I sit in, sat in many, many, many therapy intensives uh, or groups where I watched him works and I became trained, yeah. he trained me how to work this way. And I was being so fortunate because many, many, many therapists may not want to be trained in that particular way of working, understand that, but they haven't had the training. Yeah. So I really hope people listening have some sense of understanding what I'm talking about now because they may not have uh, been trained in this particular way of working. But for me, per personally, it, it was such a gift in my career to have that type of training. Definitely. So I would say people who perhaps want to develop their skills of working in this type of way to look look and see if there's any training on on how we can work with clients in a 
relational developmental uh, manner. I was very, 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 very fortunate. To... You, you were, and you know some of the names that that you talk about, the the fundamental in the therapeutic world. You know, mm. they, they're not going to be around forever, and yet you've trained with them, which For is years. amazing. And when when I talk this podcast, I think, oh, I must come out of retirement. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I know I'm not going to. Because I need of... to go back big part of me but I know how much I help people and I know I maybe there's some you know things I talk about myself with being indispensable I know I'm not or anything so I know I've retired but I also know you know I love that type of work and you know what what I can give to the professional career so there is a grieving and I don't know which podcast I think podcast before this there was certainly a grieving and loss and um when I ended my career yeah and I can this, imagine this podcast stimulates that in me. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, from somebody who's attended the training at the Manchester Institute of Psychotherapy, you know, you've passed a lot of that on to so many people, you know, before me, after me and with me, that, you know, the legacy will live on forever. Well, I'm, I'm proud of that. Yeah. And I've really, uh, I know we've come to the end of class, but I very much enjoyed talking about this and I hope I haven't um, I hope it's been clear to people listening um, because retrieval of memory work I think does need more training but I also the biggest thing is to do this in a safe secure transparent way yeah. for clients then clients won't feel overwhelmed yeah and if they work in the way you talked about where you said that wonderfully you know if this this type of regression or this type of flashback happens what would you like me to do it's such a wonderful adult statement but i think it's a very protective uh way of working yeah thank you so mm -hmm. until the next time bob do we know what we're doing next time I well what off the top of my head but I, I, i'm going to i'll i'll text you some i mean we have a long list but um uh, and i haven't got it in front of me so i'll text me you neither. So once again, it will be a surprise for everybody what we're doing in episode 67. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, I mean, life is about surprises. Life's about curiosity, yeah. enjoyment, spontaneity. So, yes. And adapting. It depends what happens between now and then. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, until next time, Bob. Yeah. Thank you very much. Speak soon. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show. Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.